Hey everyone, I'm Natalie Bensavanga, host of Five Minutes With, and this week I am so excited to have Miracle Jones. She is the Director of Policy and Advocacy at One Hood Media. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Natalie. It's such an honor. Oh, it's such an honor to have you. I've been admiring <laughs> you and your work for so long, and I'm so excited that we're finally connecting on this platform. So could you share a little bit about yourself with everybody that's watching? Yes, I am a transplant to Pittsburgh. I came uh, from Georgia uh, to Pitt for school. I uh, came for law school and then I stayed for uh, social work because obviously I just like torture myself um, through <laughs> learning. Um, but I really love the food scene here in Pittsburgh. I'm always like at Grandma B's. I'm like always like finding out like new places like to eat, to hang out, um, to go through. And even through like the this past year, um, I think it's been one of the silver linings is so many people moved to digital spaces. Mm -hmm. So we're finding out about new food places, new communities to get involved in and to support. So I've been very excited and very like happy um, now that people are are kind of like engaging community a little more and we're slowly starting to reopen. Um, but I'm a foodie. I love art. I love music. I love, you know, reading. I love to like uh, go outside and just like, walk around. I love the art scene. So that's basically just me. I'm sometimes a little introverted, which is like kind of funny because I'm doing like a lot of the work uh, like with One Hood and we're still such a front facing organization. But usually if you give me a book, some food and like a blanket outside, I'm like so happy. So that's pretty much like who I am and some of the things that I do. That sounds wonderful. You you mentioned social work. Are you, do you have your MSW? Or are you a, a therapist? What was your angle there? Yes, I got my MSW. So um, in, I think my <laughs> final career, mm -hmm. I kind of want to run um, a reentry nonprofit. And so I wanted to get my MSW to learn more about like nonprofit management and doing direct services. I am not a therapist. I do sometimes flirt with getting my LCSW, mm -hmm. but I think I'm going <laughs> to stay out of school for like a couple of years to see what like the real world is actually like for now. Um, but yeah, so that's why I I uh, continued on with school, so I'm very excited and like grateful for all the things like Pittsburgh like, has to offer, especially with like in the world of nonprofit work. Well, I, the reason I brought that up is because I also have my MSW, and now yes. I think it's so funny that we both found ourselves now moving from the social work sort of more traditional sense into utilizing those skills and how you can shape media and policy and how you can support people from that uh, space. So I think that's so interesting that. I'm not the only one that's sort of taken this other route into journalism and into the world of, of media. And speaking of which, with One Hood, you do the Power Hours. So can you talk a little bit about that initiative and in general, just the great things that you're doing with One Hood Media? Yes, so with like One Hood, we had this conversation about what is missing in the media landscape and how are we able to engage and empower folks to know what's going on in their communities and kind of remove some of like the barriers and the mystery behind it all. So with um, our C4, we had power, we started doing these power hours where we were just talking to elected officials and, and decision makers about um, issues that were impacting the community and also legislation. And then from that, we started the Sunday night sit downs because we wanted to see like what motivates people to run for office, to be advocates, like what is the reason that we see some of these legislations, what is like the hurdles and the roadblocks kind of to make uh, people and power seem a lot more accessible and a lot more like human and, and friendly because, you know, when people become elected officials, there's sometimes it's like this automatic like uh, a deference that we give to people, we kind of forget that they're humans. Um, so we did that, and then we also um, do like this week in white supremacy, what Black Pittsburgh needs to know, and ask a Black doctor again. We're just trying to like educate people, entertain people, and like empower people to know what's going on. There's so much like misinformation, disinformation out there. So we were like, okay, we have these platforms, we have these skill sets. I am a political nerd, <laughs> you know, so I'm reading all these books. I know a lot about like the history of things, but let's like bring this all to the forefront. Let's engage with folks. And so we've been doing a lot of, of programming and that we're still going to be doing um, even now that stuff is opening up, doing some like in-person recordings and, you know, we do like next level slams. So we are still trying to keep like the art 
aspect in everything um, that we do just to make it like a lot, lot more happier and accessible and more friendly. So that like when we're um, talking about really hard, difficult subjects, we don't overwhelm and depress folks. So that's some of the things that we've been doing. It's, it's been very organic and such a blessing that people actually like the programs that we put out. Well, I'm a huge fan in particular this week in white supremacy. And because I just, first of all, I thought it was such a clever name and it really caught my attention. I was like, what is this? And I had to <laughs> learn more. And, you know, I think it's really important that language is framed in a way that it says what it says and we're not using coded language. And the fact that you're just putting it out there for what it is, I think reframing it is something really positive that you don't see a lot in media. So is that something that's sort of in your minds as you're working through how you're going to talk about issues is just putting out the language that means what it says, so to speak. Yes, yeah, so we do a lot of, we call it kind of like course correcting, but with language, you know, we've been building like allyship and, and community. And so we're very specific about the language that we use and the language that we don't use. So we had some of our Jewish brothers and sisters come to us and say, hey, there are certain words that are triggers and disrespectful to our communities. Make sure you don't say these things. Make sure that you are, when you're talking about these issues, that you're not uh, uh, creating places that will make us feel pressured or, or places that we, we feel like we're gonna be attacked. We have like uh, some of our queer communities that talk about, hey, we want to make sure that when you say these things that you're not putting our communities in the crosshair. We've had people from the disability community say, hey, can you make sure that you don't say things are crazy or mm -hmm. things are violent because it is this, like this history of like pain and trauma. Mm -hmm. And so you'll see sometimes on the show, we'll literally catch ourselves like as we're talking about, oh, you know what, that's problematic or that was ableist or we're, we need to find a different way to say this thing. Thing. And so we're like learning and growing together. And I think that that's one of the reasons that people like our shows is that we're, we're human. We talk about the flaws and the mistakes that we make. We talk about um, like our, our personal issues, our personal biases, and like how we're trying to navigate and learn and grow. And so people feel like they're on um, this journey with us and that people can push back. You know, we don't live in a silo. So people disagree with us in the comments. We get to go uh, back and forth and have conversation, which is the why I think people really tune in because they see that we, we take their voice and their opinions um, seriously, even if they differ from ours. And I totally hear that. And so when we're looking at like the bigger picture and we look from last summer of 2020 to this summer now moving into 2021, which also feels like a hundred years as well as like a blink of an eye, which is so strange in and of itself. But there was so much happening in our communities, all of the mobilization efforts, the Black Lives Matter movement that brought us now to here. And now we have, and, and you had a very special, instead of uh, this week in white supremacy, it was this week in black excellence. And you had something focused on the mayor elect to be, Ed Ganey. And so my thought is for you, or my question is, do you think we would have seen Ed Ganey win had we not had all of these experiences from last summer to now? And do you really see a lasting impact maybe outside of this election space where you're seeing actual change on the ground in the work of anti-racism? Yes, um, absolutely, without a doubt, Ed Ganey does not get elected without this past year because mm -hmm. We, and I'm talking about we as in like the Pittsburgh community made a, a concerted effort to actually get to know each other, to work together, to have conversations, to build and learn about how we were all impacted. You know, we talk about the Tell Two Cities, but you know, we've had people, We, um, for me, one of the biggest things I learned about was disability community. They were talking about like how, you know, there's places we can't go. There's buildings that are not accessible to us. You know, we were working with the, the immigrant community who were talking about being pushed out and shut out. And we were like, this is not the 1920s, right? So we've been like very intentional, again, like we as the broader Pittsburgh community about learning and growing. And so when these elections came out, you saw people from all across the county going, giving people rides, educating, um, creating platforms. And that did not happen a couple of years ago on the same scale that it happens now. And so you see anti-racist work groups, you see mentorships, 
uh, coming out. You see businesses talking about they're going to be adopting different um, high schools. You see community cleanups, like, right? A few years ago, people were like, we're not going into the hills and the homes, right? You know, the hill districts, the home was, the home says we stay out of those. And now you see people actively coming, not to gentrify, but to volunteer to work together. So I, I see um, the seedlings of change. It, we're not where we need to be, right? Because we still have to um, correct and repair some of the harms that have been done. But I think people feel comfortable asking questions now, feel comfortable saying they, did, they weren't aware, they didn't know, and they want to get involved. And you see a lot of organizations, corporations, nonprofits actually starting to have those tough conversations, but followed up with action. And so we see a difference. And I think that we're going to continue to see a, a difference, regardless of who's in office. And you're going to see more mutual aid, more people coming together. And so hopefully this will be a place where everyone can thrive um, and everyone can feel comfortable and seen and supported. I love that. And not to shift gears, but I'm going to shift gears because you and I are doing something very fun together this yes. Friday. And I'm so excited because for anybody that didn't know, last year, <laughs> Miracle <laughs> and I co-hosted the Allies Ball with the amazing Marty Cummings, who is based in New York City. And the three of us got to um, have actually a lot of fun in the midst of a very difficult time sharing the great work of Allies. So having said all of that, this year, we're going to be live with each other, which I am so excited about. So what made you decide to want to be a part of the Allies Ball? Um, one, I love the fact that it's about like a uh, health, health, health care that's affordable and accessible. And I was like, this is so cool. And I was like, I get to dress up. This is amazing. <laughs> this year is like a 70s theme. And I'm like, still picking out my like outfit because I'm like, I have so much inspiration. But learning about what like Allies was doing for the community and how they're providing such necessary resources this is like why I got involved and then I was like this is a ball this is a party this is fun like I am in there and so <laughs> that's why I'm doing it again for the second year and the fact that we can do it in person I'm so excited like it's gonna be so much fun like to, I'm like to watch Marty perform in person I think it's gonna be like the high I don't think anyone's like anyone ready <laughs> no, I agree and they've had a whole year to sort of prep for this moment so I know they're gonna bring it it's gonna be amazing and so just so everybody knows, there's also a free for all dance party that anybody can attend and be a part of. And then we are going to be hosting the Feed Your Head online show, which I'm really excited about. You can still get your ball in a box so you can have some goodies and some drinks while you watch the show. It's going to be so exciting. I'm so honored to be a part of it with you. It's gonna be at Shenley Plaza. I just can't wait to hug. Am I allowed to hug you? Are you, are yes. you, are you I'm a hugger. I, I, would, I would really double mask and wear a facial could hug people during the <laughs> pandemic. I I am Southern. I am a hugger. So yes, you, I give permission to hug. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be so much fun. Well, I can't wait. I appreciate you so much and the incredible work that you do to build equity in our communities. I can't wait to see you this Friday and I hope everyone can join us. So thank you so much, Miracle, for spending just a little bit more than five minutes with me. <laughs> thank you for having me.